Another important milestone in the civil rights movement was Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier in baseball, which took place on April 15, 1947. Jackie Robinson became the first African American in the major leagues. He was signed by the Brooklyn Dodgers and made his big league debut on April 15, 1947. He faced constant racism from fans, opponents, and even his own teammates. He went on to be elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame and his number 42 is retired throughout baseball. Also, Jackie Robinson, after his playing days were over, became part of the civil rights movement and an outspoken uh, advocate for African Americans. Early school segregation cases. While the decision that would overturn Plessy versus Ferguson was still nearly four years from being decided, two other cases laid the groundwork for nationwide school desegregation. Both involved institutes of higher education, though the principles involved would also affect K through 12 education. In Sweat versus Painter, 1950, the Supreme Court decided unanimously that a Texas law school for blacks afforded the plaintiff a lesser education than he if attended its white counterpart. The ruling noted that the law school for blacks was smaller and had fewer and poorer facilities than the University of Texas Law School. In addition, the newer black law school had nowhere near the reputation than the white school did. That same year, the court also wrestled with a similar issue in McLaurin versus Oklahoma State Regents for higher education. The University of Oklahoma did not have a separate law school for blacks, so it had to admit the plaintiff. However, the school refused to allow George McLaurin to associate with other students. Officials required him to sit in isolated areas in classrooms, the library, and school cafeterias. The Supreme Court ruled this policy unconstitutional as it violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment and even the Plessy versus Ferguson decision. However, these cases affected only higher education and not K through 12 schools. Organizations such as the NAACP and other civil rights groups still searched for a test case that would address the issue of racial seg segregation in public schools. Brown versus Board, Origins. In 1954, all of the former Confederate states mandated school segregation along with the Civil War border states, states that allowed slavery but remained loyal to the Union, Oklahoma and West Virginia. The Brown case would change all this. Charles Hamilton Houston, a Howard University law professor and chief legal counsel for the NAACP, developed a strategy for dealing with the inequities of the public school segregation. The NAACP strategy sought to challenge the most glaring problems of the separate but equal doctrine by demonstrating the unfairness of school segregation outside the South. If segregation elsewhere resulted in substandard facilities for blacks, then segregation in the South would almost certainly be much worse. Lawyer Thurgood Marshall had headed the case. Marshall had already won several decisions that chipped away at Plessy, including the Sweat versus Painter decision. The NAACP enlisted African Americans in Topeka, Kansas to try enroll, to enroll their children in the schools closest to their homes. Oliver Brown wanted to enroll his daughter in an elementary school about six blocks from their home. Turned down, she instead had to walk 21 blocks to reach a bus stop for a segregated school much farther away. The Browns, one of several families in Topeka who joined the class action lawsuit, lost in district court and appealed the case to the U.S. Supreme Court. Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall, a highly respected African-American attorney and the grandson of a slave, have, had already represented the NAACP and other civil rights groups in various cases before the U.S. Supreme Court, including Sweat versus Painter and McLaurin versus Oklahoma State Regents. However, as a lawyer, he achieved the most recognition for his work in the Brown case. Because of his work defending civil rights causes, President John F. Kennedy nominated Marshall to the U.S. Secret Court of Appeals. In 1965, President Lyndon B. Johnson named him Solicitor General, and in 1967, nominated him as an Associate Justice to the U.S. Supreme Court. During his term on the court, not only did Marshall remain an active supporter of civil rights, but he also became a staunch opponent of the death penalty. 
He retired from the court in 1991 and died in 1993. Brown, NAACP's argument. The strategy the NAACP employed consisted of several arguments. First, the NAACP noted that the decision in Plessy versus Ferguson had misinterpreted the 14th Amendment. In Plessy, the Supreme Court had confirmed the legality of separate facilities for whites and blacks, provided that they were equal. In Brown, the plaintiffs asked the Supreme Court to overturn the 1896 ruling. Second, the NAACP argued that the 14th Amendment not only prohibited discrimination on the federal level, but also on the state level. This gave federal courts the right to order state governments and school boards to integrate schools. The NAACP also believed that the 14th Amendment did not guarantee the right of state governments to discriminate in the area of public education. The NAACP had already used this defense on other occasions, particularly in higher education cases and felt the same argument would be effective in K-12 schools as well. Finally, in a departure from typical discrimination lawsuits, the NAACP attempted to prove that school segregation not only violated the provisions of the 14th Amendment, but also had an adverse psychological effect on children forced to attend all black schools. The NAACP used testimony from noted child psychologists that substantiated claims that discrimination fostered a sense of inferiority in black children well beyond their school years. Opponents' arguments. Those who supported segregated education sought to counter the NAACP's claims. Education was a state issue, and each state had a right to operate its schools however it saw fit. In other words, the boards contended that the Constitution contained no requirement to integrate schools. The issue of segregation was a regional one, not a national one. Therefore, each region could deal with segregation in its own way. The school boards also rejected the NAACP's contention that segregation harmed black children psychologically, stating that no evidence proved a negative impact on white or black students. Finally, they believed that simply mixing African Americans and white students would be detrimental to the black students who were already trying to catch up academically to the past effects of slavery. These arguments were made by John W. Davis. Brown, the Supreme Court. The plaintiffs lost in federal district court and decided to appeal the ruling to the United States Supreme Court. The court agreed in 1952 to hear the case. However, several justices including Chief Justice Fred Vinson, believed that the Supreme Court did not have the authority to outlaw school segregation. Other justices worried that the court might rule school segregation unconstitutional only to find the decision to be unenforceable. Vinson died in 1953. The subsequent search of a replacement Chief Justice delayed arguments in the case. President Dwight Eisenhower nominated Vinson's replacement former California governor, and 1948 Republican vice presidential nominee, Earl Warren, believing that Warren would represent conservative viewpoints. Warren, however, surprised not only Eisenhower, but many others by shepherding in progressive decisions on civil liberties and civil rights, of which the Brown decision was just one example. Brown, the decision. Nearly a year after Warren's confirmation as Chief Justice, the court handed down its unanimous decision. Warren worked hard behind the scenes to get all the justices to agree and to forego issuing any concurrent opinions. He believed that on such an explosive subject, the court needed to speak with one voice. In a majority opinion that was, as Warren put it, short, readable by the lay public, non-rhetorical, unemotional, and above all, non-accusatory, the Chief Justice agreed that the 14th Amendment did not necessarily deal with the issue of public education. He also brushed aside the historical arguments in regard to the case, believing that the issue in question needed to be examined through a modern day lens. Warren agreed with the NAACP's assertion that the concept of separate but equal harmed the minds of African American children. Furthermore, he stated that separate educational facilities are inherently unequal and that nothing could be done to equalize all white and all black schools. 
In conclusion, the court ruled school segregation unconstitutional and ordered its end. While the May 1954 Brown decision abolished school segregation, the justices did not make any recommendations as to a schedule for desegregation. The Supreme Court answered the question in 1955 in what became widely regarded as the Brown II decision. The justices ruled here that school districts should desegregate with all deliberate speed. Many supporters of the original Brown ruling viewed the decision with concern and disappointment, feeling that the Supreme Court had made an ambiguous demand that would lead to many problems. 